and I'm the first to welcome you here to OER23. And for many of you, this is the first time we're back together since 2019. And for also many of you, this is the first time you come to OER at all. So a very warm welcome. In about 10 minutes, we'll get underway with our first keynote. But first, we we'll have some welcomes and some introductions and introduce you to a little bit to all the people behind the scenes here who are making this wonderful conference happen. So in a moment, we're going to learn about our host institution. We're also going to meet the team behind GoGN, who brought so many of their emerging researchers here. So a big welcome for GoGN. And then we're going to have some housekeeping announcements, which are obviously the key thing here this morning, before we hand over to our wonderful keynote speaker meeting this morning. And just before we get started, and just so in case there is any unforeseen emergencies, there's no fire drills planned. So if there is a drill, um, or rather if the fire alarm sounds, it is a real alarm, and we do need to evacuate the building. So please do follow staff on site in case there's any emergencies. Right. Without further ado then, we will get on the way with our presentation and I just wanted to give a big shout out um, to all of our sponsors and partners and in a minute we're also going to meet some of them, but also we're here to help you in case there's anything we can do. Every room this morning will have a room moderator, one of our colleagues from UHI who will help you get set up. There's a USB stick in every room and a friendly face. So please make use of them. <laughs> now, it's a very special occasion for us to come all the way to the Scottish Highlands and to be here in Inverness. And I'm very excited that so many great guy colleagues are joining us. And um, you know who you are here in the room in the moment. We'll ask you to all stand up, everybody from UHI, and just make yourself known. But please now put your hands together for Keith Smythe, one of our conference co <laughs> um, Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the University of Highlands Island. Welcome to Inverness. Welcome to Scotland. And welcome to colleagues for joining us online. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here for your time. We will see you in a few minutes. Um, but first, just to introduce myself, thank you so much for having me here at UHI, uh, and also uh, by Cheryl Holt. Um, so, uh, really, pleasure of wearing a couple of hats to bring the OER to the Inverness. Just to say a little bit about Inverness, um, uh, sorry, UHI, to set the scene um, and explain why it's so important for us to host the OER 23. Uh, the University of the Highlands and Islands is quite a unique institution, uh, certainly in the UK. Um, we are a tertiary institution. We cover further education and higher education. We can have students that come into the university to do an entry level vocational qualification and go all the way through to study a PhD, and that's happened. Um, so we have a really strong wide and access ethos. Um, we're here to provide higher education in a region where up until we were created, there wasn't a dedicated university presence. Uh, and we provide access to further higher education <coughs> across the Highlands and Islands region. So from Perth, not only to the Highlands, but the gateway to the Highlands, as we call it, um, all the way up to Shetland, all the way across to the other Hebrides. Um, in terms of some of the facts and figures, we certainly can share with the rich eye. Um, we cover a geographic area that, in terms of land mass, is equivalent to the size of Belgium, so a pretty big campus. We have to draw a circumference around this whole area and find it's about the size of England. Um, so we're providing access to further higher education um, in geographically and digitally distributed contexts. We're a federated university. We're made up of 12 independent um, colleges, expertise research, and educational institutes all make up the university. Um, so, we have campuses across the region. Um, we're here today um, being attended mostly by UHI and Vernest, one of our biggest academic partners. We'll also have around about 70 regional study centres um, across the whole region, um, some in very kind of rural areas, providing access to education where our streets are without them necessarily needing to, to leave and go to other parts. Country. Um, our next year is dedicated university, it's Aberdeen, 120 miles away. Um, so we're here for a very specific reason. Um, and it's not just about formal further and higher education, it's about what we can contribute to local communities that we're a part of, the local economies, and so forth. In terms of how we deliver education, um, we have a range of ways of doing this um, uh, online, branded, 
increasingly with the open. Um, and that's all part of that, you know, why the bigger picture and trying to provide access to education for those otherwise completely by accessing. With apologies, those that have a little bit of a chest thing. In terms of open education factors, we're committed to developing open education practices. So this is our ESOL ethos as an institution and our, our wider mission in trying to, um, where possible, make access to tertiary education a couple of years. Um, we have a learning and teaching enhancement strategy. Um, within that strategy, we have a set of 10 values um, with, which we co design with our staff and our students. And these values essentially say to our students, this is what we're committed to providing to you. Uh, regardless of whether you're studying FE or HE, whether you're online or on campus, whatever level you might be studying, whatever discipline you're studying, these 10 things, these 10 values should be experienced by all our students in their time with us. Um, particularly important to context of OER 23 is harnessing open educational approaches. We'll do more um, about how we're doing that across the next few days for the HR speakers. Um, but for this and for many other reasons, uh, it's really important. Um, yeah. To us, critical yeah. to what we're trying to do with the education, we get to host this event. Um, so we will thank and Marin, OGN, for um, bringing the event to, to uh, be trying for next. And we thank you for being here. Thank you for coming. We hope to meet you now. All the UHI colleagues to give us a quick way for we'll get up just so we um, can learn. So if you see folk around and around the conference, please do find out more about our wonderful host institution. <laughs> Now, when we started planning this conference, we thought, well, probably most people will come online, and those diehard fans of this wonderful event, they will make the way to Inverness. In actual fact, the majority of us are actually here in the room today, but that doesn't mean that the 50 or so participants who've dedicated time and effort to join us online aren't really the key focus as well. So for all of you online watching us live or watching the recording, a very warm welcome. We are thrilled to have you and we're very proud that thanks to Kerry and the team here at UHI and the invisible team of ALT that is working very hard behind the scenes, we can make this a hybrid conference. And with your permission of all the speakers, we do record as many sessions as possible, all of which will be made available via the online platform. And as a delegate, you will get access to that, and we will also openly publish the materials from the conference um, after the event. So today is our first time, really, in trying to capture as many parallel sessions um, and recording them so all the UHI team and Kerry's team play a crucial role in making the online experience happen. Um, this call is our social hub, so please do share your experience online and don't forget that there's a whole host of participants to network with as well. So I'm going to ask you to put your hands together one more time for all the people who come here. We welcome a very special organizing team who have brought a very special delegation here to the OER conference. I think you're going to meet all of them in a minute as they come up onto stage, and then we'll hear more from one of our colleagues, Beck Pitt, to learn more about GoGN. So GoGN team, please come up. So thanks to Pete for uh, organising the session because they've done such a great job with the OHI. We bring uh, members uh, from all over the world. It's allowed us to bring more people than we can put us down the mission to set up the um, Last month marked in the top 10 wettest marches in recorded history, right? So if you come from overseas, you get here, beautiful sunshine, even in Inverness. And I think I've been coming to all for like that. I've been coming to OER for 10 years. And the sun always shines on the OER. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to allow my colleague Beck to talk a bit about uh, what Brentia is. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark, and welcome everyone. It's so um, wonderful to be here in Inverness and with you all here at UHI. Thank you so much to UHI for being so It's really wonderful. So um, my name is Beck Pitt, and um, we're the Global OER Graduate Network. 
um, for, from the Body Hewlett Foundation, and we're celebrating our 10th anniversary um, this year. Uh, we're focused on supporting <coughs> doctoral researchers who are working on open educational topics, raising their profiles, supporting them on their doctoral journey. We're focused on equity, diversity, and inclusion, promoting that through open education <laughs> research, and then also focused on open research and developing openness as a process of research. So as I mentioned, this is the team. I'm Beth Fit, and I'm here with my colleagues, um, Martin, Campo, Rob, and Kylie. Um, and we've got Karina as well in the team. Karina's focused particularly on our DVI work as well. You can find out more about um, the team and what we do, and most importantly, more about how to get involved in the work as well at GoGN.net. And most importantly as well, we have a number of our fantastic GoGN uh, doctoral researchers and alumni here at the conference as well. We had a fantastic workshop yesterday with around 15 to 15 of our colleagues from around the world coming together, talking about their research. It was really, really a fantastic day. Um, and we've also got many of our GoGN alumni and members presenting at the conference. So please do to keep a look out for um, uh, our GoGN's um, research at the conference. I don't know if people wanted to get up or give away. Well, well, uh, uh, Anyway, I just want to say it's real privilege and honour to be here. Thank you so much. It's really wonderful. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Rob Lowe, who's going to talk a bit more about my open research. Thank you. Thank you. Right. It's just a slide. <laughs> 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 Hi everyone, I'm Rob. Uh, I lead the collaborative writing and research efforts for GoGN. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with everyone today, it's great to see you. I um, wanted to just bring to your attention our most recent publication. So just published this week, have our Open Research Handbook. This is a kind of like, you know, like you have a sitcom and then there's like all these clever different episodes, then there's like a kind of compilation episode. It's a bit like that, right? So it kind of brings together uh, stuff that we've published over the last three years into one volume. Uh, so we have our research methods handbook in there, a guide to using conceptual frameworks, and also a collection of reviews, uh, recent research papers which are written by our researchers as a kind of collective understanding of uh, sort of contemporary research that is being published. And so the idea is all these things together are kind of um, a resource that can help anyone. Uh, support anyone who's doing research in the open education space. And um, although, you know, we have several hundred members, uh, our publications have been done manually thousands and thousands of times. So there's a much bigger audience for this sort of stuff than just the VoGen network. It's all open access, it's all things to buy, and um, you're, you're welcome to you know, make use of it whichever way you know, it suits you. Uh, I'd also like to give a shout out to Brian, who's sitting over there. Brian is an artist uh, who basically created this sort of visual identity, visual style for these reports. Um, and um, making it accessible and making it kind of easy to get into and understand what's going on is a really important part of this. So please check it out. You can find it on the website. It's also on the OER23 hashtag online. Um, and if you find it useful to do something with it, let us know. We'd really be interested to hear about it. So thank you. Thank you very much. And we have one more um, welcome to say. So we've already met GoGN and UHI, and um, many shout outs I wanted to give as well to our platform partners, Cultura, who are bringing the online element of OER to life. And many of you met them yesterday in the orientation session, and they're running a session as well during the conference. Um, but I wanted to give a shout out to one of our event partners who's probably the most dedicated supporter of OER. And um, we don't call them sponsors because I think it's gone far beyond that. So a big shout out to Reclaim Hosting, who will have sponsored this event as Reclaim Video and Reclaim EdTech, and I'm not sure of Reclaim Arcade as well. So please give it up for Lauren. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Lauren Hanks. I'm the Director of Operations at Reclaim Hosting. Uh, I'm joined here today and tomorrow with Jim Groom from Reclaim as well. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, uh, Reclaim, we are entering our 10th year of business uh, this summer, and 
since the beginning, we set out to really just provide students and educators, um, you know, with sustainable and portable web hosting where they feel supported and cared for. That's our mission. Um, so we'll be talking about that more tomorrow in our session and other things that we're working on that we're really excited about. Um, in the meantime, we're really just excited to be here. Um, as Mary was saying, this is the first time um, I've been to an in-person conference since oh, we are 19. Um, and if the last few years have taught us anything, it's just that, you know, we really need to appreciate that time to be together and connect. So with that in mind, I've got a Polaroid camera today. <laughs> Jim's asked you to turn on the lights. I'm not sure if that's possible, but I would love to capture this moment. So, um, once the lights are on, on the count of three, everybody do your hair. On, <laughs> we're going to say OVR 23. All right. So, get ready. One, two, three. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> In itself be like no others. <laughs> It'll be a collector's item for years to come. <laughs> so before we go over to read his keynote now, we don't want to keep you much longer. I just want to make some more quick announcements. First, to give a huge shout out to our 12 scholarship participants who are here enjoying OER23 with us. We work very hard with all of our partners to make it as accessible an event as possible. And we're very excited to have you all with us. And there is so much in store today. Um, Tom Farrelly is here, the one and only, ladies and gentlemen, so don't miss out our Augusta this afternoon, because that will be a moment to remember. And also, towards the end of today, um, we obviously have a wonderful keynote and music from a prolific musician and speaker here at UFI, Anna Wendy Stevenson is joining us all the way from one of the most remote parts of this wonderful institution, and she's bringing students along. So straight <laughs> after her keynote, we will be going across campus. If you're having coffee and you're looking towards the sea, you will see that wonderful building um, for music and hosted by Keeves Academy, drinks, some nibbles, and then more entertainment to go. I think there's a whiskey tasting in the offing too. So please don't miss that very, very special evening. There's some room, room changes and housekeeping changes. And um, we have got all of these on notice boards and also all the brief helpers have been briefed, so hopefully you'll find your way. I have one very special announcement regarding a certain quilt that many of you are familiar with. So as you know, at least half of our wonderful quilt has traveled all the way up very carefully guarded by its current custodian, Francis Bell. And at lunchtime, you have a unique opportunity just at the top of the stairs on the second floor to meet the quilt and half of it in person and many of its creators. So for those of you in the audience who want to pay homage, um, it is a look but don't touch homage. I know it's a because we're preserving this wonderful artifact. So please do join us at lunchtime at the top of the stairs. But now, slightly over time, I will give Rika a moment to set up before we put our hands together for that welcome. And anybody else who needs a seat, anybody else who's waiting outside, please do make yourselves comfortable because you're in for a very big treat. So just give us a moment to switch over and then I'll introduce our keynote speaker. If you have any shuffling to do, now is the time. If they interrupt the waiting outside, we'll see you first. Thank you. If we're all ready then, we will get started with our first hosting plenary. And um, I'm very grateful that the co-chairs have been able me to introduce the speaker, a wonderful thought leader in our area that I've long admired, but I've only seen always on stage. And um, this year, thanks to our colleagues, we've reached out and made it possible to have fun, creativity, and 
and hopefully a lot of inspiration to kick us off with this wonderful conference. I'm not going to waste more time and make sure you get to hear Riki Topnorga, I hope I pronounced this correctly, and um, for as long as possible. So please give a very warm welcome to our opening team. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Let me know if this goes crackling again. Um, I won't spend much time on telling you who I am as well, because that's, you know, boring and you can read about it online. But I'm Associate Professor in Education Design and Technology at the Danish School of Education at Aarhus University. And you can find me on mail, Twitter, LinkedIn. And usually I post my slides afterwards. So if you want to grab them, you can go there and... and Grab your copy. Um, also, I'm just like thrilled to be here at the heart of the Scottish Highlands. I think the heart uh, term here is important for today's lecture. I also sense it's important for the community with heart-filled openness. Um, and also, I'll try to talk, perhaps, I don't know if it's metaphorically or abstract, but uh, talk about advancing open education practices and speci specifically focusing on the openness, the futurology of it all, perhaps. Um, if something needs to be switched up and down, just come and grab me. Um, and, and I've been browsing through the program and uh, the talks and the people, and I'm just really thrilled to be here and so happy that many of you are here in person so I can experience this as well. I've been, I've been asked to uh, do something that is called broad philosophy. So that's probably, you know, keeping it a bit abstract. Uh, throwing in some juicy concepts, um, trying to provoke a bit of thinking, uh, speaking a bit strangely, uh, stuff like that. But given, given the conference and the community, I can also shout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll shout instead. Can you hear me still? Yes, yeah, yeah. great. I'll take on my teacher voice. <laughs> great. So, so um, you hear me switching up now. I just want to. Um, so, so given the conference and the community, this talk will probably not be saying something totally radical, uh, brain wrecking, because I think you are kind of there with me, hopefully so. Uh, interesting, if not, then please, you know, come and fight me afterwards <laughs> or in the questions. But hopefully something will still provoke a thought or inspire for future adventures into theory method practices on your own terms. These are, you know, these are all our adventures, but it's also all each and everyone's adventure. Then there's also a lot of 10 years anniversary, I sense. Uh, and this is also actually my 10 year anniversary for handling my PhD and starting my assistant professorship. So this is kind of also a 10 year anniversary with thinking about uh, high education futures and how to future higher education in very open ways. Uh, I made something up, I don't know if it's true, uh, but it's an idea. So. I did something uh, focusing on hybrid futures, working with hybridizing futures, and, and recently talked a bit about that on, on hyper hybrid futures. Did a lot on future environments, the philosophy of place and space and environments, and how to feel alive in education and how to feel at home in education, and how education, education environments, OERs, should also have an atmosphere, which is something I recently started. Working with, and we'll talk a little bit about as well, and then future speculation that's kind of all the crazy shit. So, uh, thinking thoughts without data, stuff like that. What's the point? What's the value? What's the worth? Why are we doing this? Uh, what's the purpose of higher education? And so on and so forth. Today, let's, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure where we'll end up. Uh, time will probably run out, as it usually does, but where we'll end up will hopefully have some value. I think that's how I have used to phrase this. Try to take OER 23 on an adventure into hyper hybridity, whatever that is. So I've been showing this slide a lot. Um, I really like this vision for 2030, Universities Without Walls, that came out of UA, uh, because it's quite value laden, value grounded, vision driven in a nice non corporate way. Mm -hmm. uh, and what they, the vision they share for 2030 is really focused on. The collaborative, co-creative, co-operative spirit of institutions, so cooperating 
They be co-creative, being collaborative with each other, with the world, the society, with students, uh, not thinking so much about the money, even though they're important, of course. Uh, without walls and open boundaries, which I think fit the OER 23 theme quite, quite well, and this is actually also the theme of the vision. And then this talk about the hybridization of roads, practices, spaces, and cultures. And I think that's quite important because often when I hear talk about hybrid education in the context of technology or digital education, it often means the high flex model. And that's not, that's not actually where the work comes from and what it actually means and how it was used up until the pandemic, kind of. It was also used in that way. But just to say, that's not how I use it. Um, I use it use it to kind of cover this spirit. So how we can uh, complicate entangled roles, practices, spaces, cultures of academics, students, institutions, world societies, and how we can see institutions as a sort of communities. So with that said, what does it actually then mean to the hybrid? If it's not the hybrid model, if it's not someone online and someone on, on site, a bit like now, uh, but it's actually something else. Uh, how can we understand this term? So these are, well, this is a towel. So that's a tiger owl. Uh, and when the towel becomes a recognized species, you will not think of it as a tiger owl anymore, but just a towel. <coughs> and so that's the idea of hybrids. That's a butter fan, and you can make up things for the other ones do not mind making. So, so I'm stealing this. But you can find them online if you look for hybrid animals. They are totally this beautiful as metaphors for how swings the education might be and become. Uh, and yeah, and if you want it, there's a lot of stuff written about it, but just to kind of jump forward here, um, hybrids, so hybrids in philosophy, in theory, uh, not native to the digital field, the tech field, refer to new species, forms, or culture, creative confusion, or dissolution of separate past. So we are like alchemists kind of trying to mix together stuff in new ways to create new species and species understood really broadly here. So that's hybrids. To create hybrids, we engage in hybridization. So hybridization describes the potential process of dissolving of using dichotomies to create these hybrids and where the hybrid is still a very kind of unstable species. So that's kind of uh, engaging in intentionally designing for future hybrid and species in hybridization. And I think that's what many of us are doing, uh, listening to what is happening and trying to create something of worth of value. Then the notion of hybridity, that's what captures the relation between a new hybrid and its source material. So uh, the, the hybrid here might have some uh, qualities from the tiger, some qualities from the owl, but it brings them together in new ways that creates this hybridity of the thing. And if that's not present in what we're trying to create here as an OER, as a learning activity, as a learning design, well, then it's not hybrid. And if you're not able to point to it and see it unfold in some way or another as a felt emotion, activity, whatever, well, then the hybrid is not stable and unstable in an unproductive way. Then there's a the notion of hyper-hybridity. I just looked it up again yesterday and there are actually some stuff out there uh, but I kind of made that up. Uh, hopefully, or luckily, it's not in, on clash with what's already out there, I think. But hyper hybridity is then, if you imagine mixing together all these species and that kind of monster, then happening. And that's probably how I practice education to the great frustration, despair of my students mm -hmm. most of the time. <laughs> so, hyper hybridization dissolves and fuses multiple hybrids and hybrid dimensions as one to create this hyper-hybris. And that's what I will be talking a bit about today until someone stops me. <laughs> then you can fight them and then we can spend the whole day talking. <laughs> so, uh, I really like this uh, quote from Jesse Stormall. Uh, it's, it's also kind of a 10 year anniversary, uh, saying that as a philosophical concept, hybridity suggests this hesitation at a threshold. It's, it's simmering, it's shimmering, something new is happening, we are not quite sure we understand it. It might be a bit scary, uh, but also kind of fluffy. Uh, so hybridity is not an attempt to neatly bridge the gap and create a fixed structure, a shiny new hole, but it's then this moment of presentation. So everything is always opening up rather than being finished. 
So Habilsi is about the moment of play in which two sides of the binaries begin to dance around. So that's that kind of dance is that kind of um, processual way of thinking about uh, learning the science or whatever we're thinking about pedagogy, uh, engaging students, trying to aim for that is, is what Hybris is about, and then bringing together new paths and new ways. Then the notion of, now we've seen more skin, I think, um, but then thinking about hybrid, hybrid learning, again, as I mentioned, multiple hybrid dimensions that are engaged and hybridized at the same time. So here we are not necessarily only kind of playing around with the online and online to use them in a new way, not just a high flex model, or, or create a new type of campus by uh, thinking differently about uh, student uh, life and uh, society life, but trying to mix that, but mixing like a meeting bread, is that the right term? Uh, meeting bread and putting in more people to create a new kind of bread. So that might be uh, playing with time, playing with space, playing with digital, playing with the role of being a student uh, and the role of uh, seeing yourself uh, as a species on a planet and, and all trying to have that kind of, uh, if you've seen that meme, uh, a radical, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, conspiracy theories. So there's like all this respects going around and there's like all these things that are interconnected and you're standing there like a madman pointing in all directions. That's kind of hyper ability. So, why hybrid, hybrid education, or OERs, or open education now? Um, I think uh, it's very needed now because we really need to reimagine open education within these anticipatory regimes and close predicted futures that we find ourselves in, in relation to policy, systems, institutions, sometimes even ourselves when we talk about education and where we are going. So our current anticipatory regimes Taylor and all talking about the anticipated education. Amazon Fasha talked a brilliant article talking about the anticipatory anticipatory regimes education. Describe this particular modern way of being, thinking, and living toward the future. There are not only something to imagine, but it's, it's kind of disciplining us. We already know the future. We just need to discipline ourselves so we get there. We know we will need 10,000 new engineers. We know that uh, this kind of technology will be needed in the future. We know AI will play this kind of role. We just need to discipline ourselves or our students or our training systems to get there along the corridor. So, so this is to minimize the risk of, of failure, we can minimize the risk of a future unknown. We need to plan for the future. Uh, and that uh, then creates a sense for students, teachers, institutions that the future is, is inevitable in the present already, and we just need the right skills, we just need the right competences, we just need the right knowledge, understanding, and then we will get there. So this kind of closing down of the future is very, very problematic, and we need specific methods and, and frameworks and ways of thinking that will kind of allow ourselves to stay in this, in this very unpleasant space of, of being open to all sorts of futures, even the preposterous one. So I really like the adaptation of preposterous futures and futures cone that some of you uh, might know, uh, which is actually from something very uh, orderly like foresight studies, studies, future studies, and futurology, or whatever they call themselves. Uh, uh, kind of came up with this, and then it's, it's been a prominent role also in speculative design work with it. So, so what we're standing now is really within this kind of narrow corridor when we talk about the future, we talk of something that will happen, so that's the future in the singular, the projected future where we're standing now, we will know in 10 years, this will be needed by one year tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Probable future, so this is probable, so this is probably the way we should go, this is where we need to go, we need to get ready as an institution, we need to get our students ready, to get ourselves ready, to get our OERs ready, so on and so forth, very narrow corridor still. And so in the original model, it was possible futures that was said that was needed we needed to kind of open up way more when thinking about what is possible. But when you went to companies, industries, institutions, what what they were thinking, oh we are really in the wild now, was still all the way in here. So that's why he added preposterous futures. He said, okay, we actually need to think about preposterous futures to stay within the possible futures. Way more is possible than to think. 
we need to to have some crazy thoughts, crazy thinking here about how education could look, how institutions could act, and how students could feel, experience, think in education. So this is this is something I've been working with uh, recently as well. I really like it. It's not so I can say that it's not my subtitle. I really like the subtitle of, of this book. Uh, hopeful futures for higher education and the ambition of the book uh, coming from uh, philosophy and theory is okay what kind of frameworks are needed to, to kind of believe in hopeful futures for higher education uh, and how do we and, and my question in fact philosophy was that's very nice but how do we design for the arrival of hopeful futures in these kind of grim dark times so that was kind of my response to the anticipatory regimes that we need possible frameworks for imagining, that's philosophy, and that's what philosophy is very good at, but also manifesting more global future high education institutions by materializing what Ronald Barnett in the Ecological University calls feasible utopias. So that's within the possible, even though they might seem preposterous to people looking from it from the outside. So that's also where, where I kind of uh, gained in this notion of hope punk. So hope punk and grim dark are very used concepts. They're not actually from philosophy. You might have been able to tell that by the names, but they're actually from like uh, media culture studies and, and go about you know, certain kind of science fiction, certain kind of movies that are either grim dark or hope punk. So uh, Adia Romano here is. Uh, that kind of introduced the concept, not in a research article, but you can find it online. It says that hope punk signifies an insistence on hope, humanity, virtuousness, and possible futures, not as this kind of purely naive, optimist, or utopian state, uh, but as an active political choice made with full self-awareness that things might be bleak or even frankly hopeless, but you're going to keep hoping, loving, being kind, nonetheless. I think that's really what is needed when we create educational materials, think about uh, <coughs> coming up with teaching sessions, designing future institutions, that kind of attitude. Uh, because otherwise, we might as well give ourselves over to the green dark, this future in the singular sense. So, this kind of, uh, so in this way, Hope Punk uh, here uh, signals a generally sincerely activist spirit of fighting for something worth fighting for. And demanding this kind of more kind hearted, desirable futures for what the robust futures cone called preferable worlds or preferable futures. Futures we want to arrive at. And we cannot, you know, delay the tracks from the press because then we are in within the predicted and probable <coughs> futures. We need to kind of jump there. So this is the future we want. And then backwards engineer our way back to the present by thinking about what kind of choices do we then need to make. To be able to make that jump. I don't know if that makes sense in any way, but that's the way of thinking about it. Rather than thinking, oh, what will happen tomorrow? Let's jump to that preferable future and then see what kind of paths, probably choices, we then have to make. If you want a more kind of philosophic, philosophical take, take on it, uh, Eric Lee Wright uh, wrote this book on envisioning real utopia. So here you can also hear the sense of feasible utopia, hope punk futures, and so on, so on, emanating from this. I have no idea of time, so what we have left, like, 10 ish minutes? Yeah. That was five. And he said, yeah, I'm going to do this. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we manifest them? So what I've been using <coughs> is a speculative design for unrealistic futures. So we really go into another kind of design tradition and then leading it into learning design, or education resource design, or whatever need be. Like, we need to find other kind of stances approaches, methods, if we are actually going to think differently about what we're actually doing. So, so for me, speculative design is really nice. Design thinking of social dreaming as the way what we're aiming for with our design. Uh, and as I say, well, we need to experiment with ways of developing new and distinctive world with views when we're designing. Again, these are really coming from kind of industry, uh, innovation, entrepreneurship. So if they can do it, I think education should probably also be able to do it. Um, and and again, they say, well, we're not talking about a space for experimenting with how things are, maybe better or different, but about other possibilities altogether. We are more interested in deciding for how things could be, the jump we talk about, with unreality, because it's within the possible. So again, 
following from this, you can see these kind of two pathways standing before us, the pathways uh, towards a singular future, prediction, trying to predict what will happen, trying to predict what we need to be, all this kind of visioning way, uh, trying to make some jumps, uh, trying to uh, envision a desired future state, and then look backwards to the present. Uh, building a new corridor between the states, as, as Bill talks about. So again, um, this is, you know, if you, if you are hungry for more, you can kind of look into these uh, two <coughs> light readings. Um, they're not light. Uh, and they're not probably helpful, but they will have some concepts, have some thinking, trying to introduce new theories, and then, you know, it's up to you, sorry, uh, to build that future. Um, I can't help you there. Um, but again, there are some fruitful things in there. Again, it's all one one action to think about is so if I'm this kind of alchemist trying to create a hyper hybrid beast for a preferable future that are out there in the wild 20 years ahead in time, <coughs> what kind of ingredients am I mixing here? In what kind of order or composition? Like what does these words even mean? Am I trying to uh, create a new composition of Thinking differently about people on the planet, and I'm thinking different about the local and the global, the notion of local, uh, as we kind of roaming around high location across the time. And I'm thinking differently about the, the connections between study life or education world. And then again, this crazy conspiracy theory is what are all the lines and how am I kind of weaving this together? Now I think I have like five minutes left. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm speaking very fast. It's all on video or something. You can go back and this is great. So it makes sense. Well, it can make sense. Yeah, so I mentioned there's like a couple of chapters in the book talking about this. But in the end, taking us on this adventure, we need to know. I'm actually from Nordic language and literature, so there's a, a narrative model of you know beginning, middle, end. So now we are nearing the end, nearing home again. Uh, so uh, so if you've been in the wild, nothing really makes sense. There's not a scary animal. You didn't know what was really happening. But now we are going, going home. Uh, but it's a different home because I think there are some really big questions, challenges, uh, wicked problems, if you use that term, that are kind of facing education in a very strange way. Uh, when we think about future OERs, future home education, future institution, and that's the question of, of these three hope punk hyper hybrids. So the place for the future is how do we have <laughs> more spirits that felt only our environments through perhaps using something as atmospheric design, which is a design tradition from the design philosophy building on Gerner Böhme's concept of the atmosphere and atmospheric design. How can we actually, like, why are we here? Why are we not online? Well, because we are not really good at creating homes online for education and homes for people where they can live and feel and sense and touch each other in a metaphorical sense, but just as meaningfully. Keep around future. So uh, often we talk about equality and we talk about student center, but what does that really mean? So within design, at the moment, there's a turn against human centered design. Understood <laughs> as human is this kind of, we think we know what it means, but we actually envision a certain kind of humans in our head when we talk about it. And there's lots of other humans out there that we then not see the same student center learning. Who's that student? I'm thinking, like, who's that person? Are we are we actually thinking uh, have students as other humans and they're not like us? I know that's a really traditional term, but taking it way more radically, like at least in Denmark, we are not really taking it seriously like different cultures, uh, different genders, uh, different uh, economic backgrounds, but we're saying, well. Uh, high education uh, is uh, equally open to all. Everyone can equally study at the university, uh, but that's not really the same as equity in a certain way. It's not really the same as universal design, which is against inclusive design. So I can really find on this. I don't notice anything else, but I can sense that's really different. Uh, important to work against inclusive design. This doesn't really make sense, but this notion of universal design really makes sense, I think. Uh, having a world for each student or something like that, but keeping the collective, keeping the community. It's not like student pathways and doing normal things. Everyone is working together. Last one, 
planet wide futures. So that's, the, I think that's the most radical one. I don't have no idea how to do this. But he ended up uh, open education going from egocentrism to ecocentrism. So, how do we have education for the glaciers or for the blackbird uh, or for the fox? And what does that even mean? But if, we, if education is not for the planet, no one will take care of the planet, except in what's in it for us, that kind of value proposition from the human centered perspective. And how do we make education that are not human centered or not ego centric, but actually ego centric? So, again, if not, you know, these are on the slides. I'm just trying to carve out some of the driving concepts within these notions. So, for placeful design, placeful OERs, we can think about uh, does our OERs, does our open education online practices actually have atmosphere? Are they emanating worlds and cultures? Do they create, do they tune people for and create a certain mood? Is it a felt place? It's like having a home. Is it not anywhere but decidedly somewhere? I think that's the most important notion here. And I'm thinking about it in architectural time, architectural terms, or in lived place terms. I think that's one thing to think about. Are we actually, you know, designing staging atmospheres and doing place making so people can actually take place? <laughs> Second thing to think about. And, and I think they're connected, but I don't know how yet. I mean, I really don't know. I just started to kind of think about this. Um, I'm really excited, as you can tell. Uh, I think there's, some, there's a lot of philosophy in here about what it means for design. Open pedagogy, open OERs, uh, oh, well, that's it, sociology. Uh, OERs and so on and so forth, institutions. I don't really know yet. But I know it's important to start thinking about OER cultures for other humans. That term is coming from uh, to reverse the design from Escobar and what it means to design for with other voices. Sean Bain, uh, your colleague, a friend, can visit me, said, well, that's actually majority design because the majority of people is living outside the wide northern hemisphere that uh, creates most of educational thinking. How do we do other mean OERs? How do we come from what the Vinas talks about as totality, sameness, to infinity and otherness, if you want to have the most radical aspect? Oh, yeah. Last one. So the planet wide OERs. How to think about multi species education? How to think about doing education in, with, for, from the planet, creating OERs that cares about the world? What does that even mean? Mm -hmm. How do we create these cultures for the modern human? Can we have trees in them? Can we have bees here? Uh, how do we create education that are for them or with them? Uh, and how do we decenter? OERs and, and think about anti anthropocentric thinking practices. It's really difficult. I'm really struggling when I'm trying to do this and think about this because I don't know how to make it make sense. I just know it's important to have it because otherwise we're kind of really lost. I think if we are burning the planet, uh, Denmark is there in pack for a yearly practice in, in March, and now we're just burning, burning stuff for the rest of the year in resource wise. So, last slide. I decided that's nice behind it, but you can have a look. So as we help bring into being, if we want to, these new hyper hybrid OER environments, equity, it's eccentrism, uh, kind of things, to reimagine the place of person's patterns in education, we must really, really make sure these hyper hybrids are not sinister machines or systems, but kind hearted beasts honoring the purpose of spirits, opening up or open education. Uh, and I think with the crowd for doing that. So over to you, you know. <laughs> Look up. Sorry for taking a bit. No, you were perfect. And we have five minutes for questions. So and there are actually microphones in the ceiling all above you. So we don't need to do running around the mic today. So please do raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. Um, we can't see you all that well from where we are. So when we come to you with our question, please just tell us who you are. And Anne-Marie will kick off with you. And um, so go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, Anne-Marie Scott, uh, currently unemployed. <laughs> gainfully, gainfully unemployed. Um, listening to your talk and this technological way of thinking about it, but I'm very struck by the, the last point about 
um, OERs for the planet. And what, what's particularly striking me is some of the conversations we had at the Commonwealth Forum in, in Calgary last year talking about resilient education and the role that um, Indigenous knowledge can play in, in a lot of this space, where there are different perceptions and relationships to the environment and the OER, our Northern Hemisphere, Western conceptions. But there's also an inherent tension between that kind of knowledge and open education. Um, that's knowledge that has a, a, a different dissemination path as well. So I don't really, I don't think I have a question so much as I see a tension in that space that some of the answers in terms of not burning our whole planet um, are in conflict potentially with some of our feelings around openness and open education. I yeah, don't yeah, really I, know what to do with that. <laughs> no, and I think actually what you're talking about is kind of a connection between the other human indigenous knowledge, other kinds of knowledges, I'm mm -hmm. saying it in the plural sense again, and then how that might help us in the mess we find ourselves in. And there's some really, and I got goosebumps, not to my own thing, but someone else's. Um, there's some really nice uh, writing by, I think, uh, yeah, Escobar for one, but also Tony Fry uh, had an article called uh, The Science for the Global South. We are harsh critique of, of modernism and the North and how we really, really fuck things up uh, for not only ourselves but the whole planet because then we exported that kind of thing and eradicated uh, indigenous knowledge or at least pushed it out of our education, education and education institutions and that might actually help us. And now it seems really strange because it's so, you know, we are so enculturated in a certain way of thinking. But there are some really nice examples. Uh, so the, the, the Ganges, the river in, in India, has been granted personhood. Uh, again, that's that's really working for the modern human. And the thing that helps helps with uh, uh, bestowing personhood on the Ganges River, and also the Amazons and another river I can't remember right now in New Zealand, I think, is that suddenly it becomes a person. It's not a person, but we need to start somewhere. And by being a person, we can then sue people not for putting something in the river that will hurt us, but for putting something in the river that will hurt the river, because it's a person. And so if we could kind of extend that to trees, and a lot of indigenous knowledges are doing that, uh, like uh, having to deliberate even Iceland, that's kind of the law. Mm -hmm. um, when they are building roads and new structures, they have to go and check if there's any uh, berries or spirits living in the rocks and stuff, and if that, the road has to go around it. And it seems so silly. Like, but perhaps it's, it's that silliness that are dangerous, you know, to us at the moment. But we're insisting on having this conversation in the frame of where we are, which is our frame. Yes. <laughs> I think we have one more question at 10 years. Yeah. And, and then we have one, we'll come to the very end. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Antonio uh, from the Knowledge Equity Network and the University of Leeds. So I have a difficult question. Yeah. How do, how do we communicate all this utopia, uh, this philosophy, very ideological as well, lovely metaphors, and I think it, it resonates with everybody's ambitions and aspirations here. How do we communicate all this and engage with alternative or other discourses from, you know, a lecturer in history in the University of wherever, a lecturer in biochemistry in the University of wherever, or even more difficult, when you think about the Global South, there are many places where they don't have a repository where to block things. Yeah, something that we are kind of deriding <coughs> as very 1990s repositories. They don't have repositories. The majority of universities in the world don't have experts in OER like we have here. How do you engage with those communities with these visions that are very much, you know, away from the truth reality of not having the basis? Yeah, so. Yeah, and now I want to jump to another slide, but I'll try to say, say this, you know, then yes, I can. So one thing is to to start not not building stuff for others from our own standpoint and start to kind of listening and team up and go places or allow them to, you know, build their own futures and not us coming to many them in a certain way. Um, as is certainly the case with some people, but it's not so bad. Um, but the, the answer to the first part of the question, the difficult question, how do we, you know, how do we do this with all the beautiful metaphors? And that's what's why I ended at this slide. This is a design project that are trying to create a new future 
by creating these train wagons with mountains that can drive around the country, creating mountains everywhere for chiefs or something. So the, the quick answer, well, it's not a quick answer, but if the answer would be we need to start materializing them. So we need to build, construct, go together to build a kind of other humans' own yard. And then for someone, not for everyone, but for particularly someone that are not ourselves and that we acknowledge as not ourselves, as Lewis spoke and Lewis said, we can never understand each other or another person. And as long as we think we can understand another person, then, then we are in, uh, in the vicinity of doing harm to that person because we then start to design based on the understanding that we think we know who that person is and what they need. Something else is needed here. So starting to materialize these uh, mini units of this, if it's an OER for the beast, I don't know what that means, but I'm really interested. What would that mean to have open educational resources for bees, not for humans, for bees? Like, what's that? I'm really interested. I have no idea. Uh, what is an OER for, I don't know, uh, now Ganges has personhood, or for robots? It's only for robots. You know, that's also other humans. If a uh, river can be, what would that be? Do they know we are only for the robots? Well, I think maybe at that's a moment for us to make way for a conference and close the discussion. We're afraid we run out of time, but before we.